Well, it's a great pleasure for me to um, to to welcome you, Martin, to this um, conversation. Um, if if at all possible, we would have done it as we've done in the past at King's. Um, but given the current pandemic situation, we are doing it um, uh, online. Uh, but I still wanted to have this interview uh, so that we can share. Uh, I can share your insights and your experience from a very, very long and distinguished career with the United Nations and at the front lines of UN's response, humanitarian response to to conflict and emergency. I, I will uh, bring us to the present, as it were, to examine some of the current challenges as you see them and particular concerns that you have about the application of humanitarian principles in situations of armed conflict. But I do want to go back to, as it were, where we started for you and, and how you see the evolution of the UN systems and perhaps also highlight some of the key experiences that I know you were involved in, um, both in the field, in Afghanistan, very interesting period as Deputy SRSG in, uh, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and also your central role in setting up the Action Mind Service. But if we were to go back and, and look at the evolution of the humanitarian response system after the Cold War, uh, where would you start and putting yourself at the center of the story? Well, I, I guess that the easiest thing for me probably is to start with uh, Afghanistan 32 years ago, because it is almost exactly 32 years ago that the last Soviet soldier uh, left Afghanistan after 10 years in the country, supporting the pro-communist regime in Kabul against the insurgency of groups that became known as the Mujahideen, who were supported by Pakistan and the CIA, the United States. And when we arrived um, as the new UN office of the coordinator for assistance to Afghanistan, the sense was that a new phase of operations was <clears throat> opening up. And um, I had the very great good fortune of working with two extraordinary and visionary leaders. Uh, one was Prince Sadruddin Aga Khan, who had been High Commissioner for Refugees for, for 12 years, uh, but who was appointed by the Secretary General as coordinator of these aid operations for Afghanistan in mid-1988. And he asked me to go and be his representative in Pakistan. He had representatives in Iran, in the Soviet Union, and of course in Kabul, in the capital, with the government. And um, so I was sent to Islamabad in Pakistan um, to contribute to the effort to establishing a genuine humanitarian uh, relief operation um, in the period immediately following the departure of Soviet troops. Now, I think it's important to point out that during the 10 years of the conflict between Soviet forces and the Mujahideen, there had been no major UN or Red Cross relief operations. And I'll come in a moment to, to why that was. But instead, the, the cities, Kabul and the other major cities of Afghanistan, uh, were supported and relief was provided to their inhabitants by the Soviet Union and its allies. And the Mujahideen were assisted by a network of of NGOs that were really solidarity organizations. So you wouldn't find there the, the Oxfams and the Save the Children's that you would have found in other situations. 
but he would have found uh, the Swedish Committee for Afghanistan. And these organizations made no um, pretense of operating in accordance with humanitarian principles. They were um, solidarity groups. They were supporting one side in the conflict. So, and this brings us, I think, to the reason why there was no major UN or, or Red Cross relief operation in Afghanistan during the, during the war. And that was because it wouldn't have been possible to do it while upholding the humanitarian principles of impartiality and neutrality. Uh, so that was the thinking uh, behind the absence of the UN and uh, the ICRC. The ICRC was there <coughs> only dealing with um, um, the war wounded. They had two they had hospitals for the war wounded. When we arrived, Sadruddin said, right, now I'm going to come and visit the region and negotiate what came to be known as the humanitarian consensus. And the idea behind the humanitarian consensus was that in order for uh, the, the assistance to be really impartial and neutral, needs had to be identified by the UN. And we needed to be able to provide uh, relief for people's needs wherever the need was greatest, whether that was in a government controlled area or a Mujahideen controlled area, and whether that was in <laughs> the area controlled by one particular Mujahideen commander or another particular Mujahideen commander. So over the period of a couple of months, we negotiated First, Sadruddin negotiated with President Najibullah in Kabul, an understanding that he would authorize relief operations to take place both cross-border and cross-line. So relief could come in from Iran, from Pakistan, from the Soviet Union, but it could also be distributed out from the major cities into areas controlled by the Mujahideen mm. under the UN's flag. Mm. <laughs> when we arrived and told some of the solidarity NGOs that we were planning to negotiate this, I mean, they were frankly incredulous. Mm. But to cut a very long story short, it actually worked. Mm. And for what, about six years? until the um, takeover by the Taliban in 1996, relief operations were run by the UN according to these principles, uh, openly, um, with transparency, letting everybody know where we were going to travel to. Uh, and that was, the, that was the principle behind it. And just to add one little um, element to it. One of the most critical needs in Afghanistan when we arrived was the widespread presence of landmines, mm -hmm. anti-personnel landmines, in areas to which the refugees living in <clears throat> Pakistan and Iran would want to return. Many of the villages in the areas just within the Afghan border um, on the Pakistan, you know, Pakistan, Afghanistan border were heavily mined. Mm. So we had to develop a program that would address this need. And we insisted that that program too should be subject to the same principles of impartiality and neutrality as the rest of the humanitarian operation. <clears throat> and maybe just a, a final word on this, it may be just worth reminding ourselves why mm. 
we felt we needed to do this? Why did we think we had to operate in this particular way? Why was the humanitarian consensus important? And I think it's, it's really very simple when you think about it. It is that if a humanitarian operation is to be considered impartial and neutral, it must not be possible for parties to the conflict to see that operation as biased against them. So in other words, a humanitarian relief operation cannot afford to be seen as favoring one side in the conflict over another. Mm. And one of the things that, that we prided ourselves on during that period was that we were never seriously accused of being biased in favor of, of one side or, or another, or of one Mujahideen faction against another. Mm. Um, we, we, we kept to the principle that this humanitarian consensus uh, needed to be uh, the core of the, of, of the program in order for the program to be seen as impartial and neutral. Mm. Um, and as you've implied in your um, introduction, Matt, uh, over the last 30, well, 30 odd years, I, I've been observing and in some cases taking part in operations in other countries, in other situations, it has been a cause of concern that these principles seem to me to have been progressively compromised. Mm. I mean, I think uh, that's extremely interesting and a very, very good place to start. And it's difficult not to go to the present um, and, and pick up the discussion there. I know there are other things I want to ask you about your experiences in, in Bosnia as well. But, but I do want to get back to you on, 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 on this particular experience in Afghanistan and the, the ability to operate under very, very difficult conditions. Because, of course, the period you are talking about is also when you had the upsurge of a horrific civil war, isn't it, between 92 and 96, which was the background uh, to the, the Taliban's rise to power as well. And I wonder, I suppose, the question, the sort of, you know, devil's advocate kind of question, what, what if you had not been able to secure a consensus around those humanitarian principles? And, and I'm thinking here, let's take the case of, of Syria today, uh, where the government um, in Damascus say, well, you know, we'll agree to uh, access um, uh, we'll let you operate, we'll let you provide humanitarian relief to certain areas, but we are going to tell you where they can go and where they cannot go uh, and take it or leave it. Now, that's putting it sort of very, very bluntly. But I'm wondering what whether your argument is partly that a, there was a general consensus uh, back 25, 30, you know, 40 years ago about the sanctity of these principles, and that has been hollowed out. Uh, or does it depend, is it very, very context specific, depending on the individual conflict? Because sometimes, of course, the humanitarian relief operation itself becomes an instrument which the parties themselves want to use. And they might use it indirectly, simply by blocking access to certain areas and so on and so forth. So I wonder, I wonder um, whether the, the sort of humanitarian consensus, how do you secure humanitarian consensus in other settings? What do you need? Do you need some kind of leverage? Do you need some kind of support? Um, I think that's raised by your very interesting experience from Afghanistan. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, my first response would be that if we had not been able to <clears throat> obtain the agreement of all the parties, I'm convinced that Sadruddin would have said to the Secretary General, I've given it my best shot. Mm. It's not working. It's not going to work. Mm. 
um, the UN should not continue to be involved yes. in a situation where it cannot guarantee that its assistance will not benefit one side to the conflict over others. We can't afford for UN humanitarian aid to be compromised in this way. And what we shouldn't forget mm. is that the, the NGOs that were operating in Peshawar and Quetta and in, in, in Iran, uh, delivering cross-border assistance, could have continued to do so. Mm. Uh, a lot of it was done clandestinely, mm. um, uh, and th that could have continued. Yes. So um, if I fast forward yeah. to 2011, um, when, um, I, I mean, I happened to be working at that particular time in, in, in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi, yes. but I watched with some uh, serious concern when I realized that uh, the UN was being invited to operate in Syria mm. in conditions where uh, the guarantee of free access on the UN's own discretion to areas outside government control was not going to be forthcoming. <clears throat> yes. um, I asked co colleagues who were who were working in the UN at the time, you know, what, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Mm. And of course, circumstances and the political environment have dramatically changed mm. since uh, 1995, 1996. Um, and one has to take all these things into account. But I think what has happened is that the, the idea that the UN should provide humanitarian relief aid mm. in situations of ongoing armed conflict um, has taken hold in a way that it, um, well, in my view, that it shouldn't have. Yes. Um, but that's my personal view. And I think this really needs to be more carefully explored yeah. um, than it has been um, recently. And that's why uh, some colleagues and I are working on a project to take a look at this and to see what the specific challenges are that confront um, the UN and, and the ICRC when deciding on uh, whether to engage in, in relief operations in these situations. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and personally, I think that the debate so far has not um, perhaps given enough attention to the risk that um, if these standards are not maintained, if these principles are not maintained, um, there's a risk that inadvertently uh, the UN and the ICRC are providing um, an unbalanced level of support to one party to the conflict mm -hmm. over the other. And therefore, um, risk compromising their impartiality and neutrality. Mm. Now, of course, we could have a situation in which the UN and the ICRC would say, look, uh, we think that, that humanitarian principles, as we have um, understood them in the past, and as you, Martin, understand them from your time in Afghanistan in the 1990s, Mm. that these are out of date mm. and that we should not be um, fettered by the need to adhere 
strictly to these humanitarian principles. Uh, fine. Mm -hmm. But then I think the, the, the worry, if one does that, is that the, the notion that uh, the, these organizations are becoming parties to the conflict is very difficult to shake off. Yeah. The, 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 there's another element to this, perhaps, because sometimes the, the concept of the humanitarian principles is conflated with the idea of, of what is contained in international humanitarian law. Mm. And although they are complementary, if you like, they're not identical, they're not the same. Mm. And <clears throat> Just taking a look at the international humanitarian law side of this for a moment. The Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols make it clear that in a country which is affected by an ongoing armed conflict, the recognized government may request assistance from international organizations. International organizations may offer that assistance and may provide it if requested, subject to the condition that the government will not, and here I quote, arbitrarily withhold consent to the provision of relief operations in areas outside its control. Mm. And so that is the principle under IHL on which parties to the conflict and most notably the, the recognized government must accept that these international organizations can operate impartially and neutrally on their territory mm. if they are to operate at all yes. they yeah. don't have to they don't have to operate of course governments are, are completely <clears throat> um, within their rights to say no i'm not going to accept un support under such conditions mm. or icrc support under such conditions but um if they do accept that support, then they must accept those conditions. Mm -hmm. And what my colleagues and I worry about <clears throat> is that once you abandon that conditionality, then the whole architecture of international humanitarian law with the obligations that it imposes on parties to conflict mm. is somehow undermined. Yes. And the ability of these organizations to remind parties to the conflicts of their obligations under IHL uh, in, in other areas, in, in the way that they um, treat prisoners, in the way that they uh, in some cases are deliberately attacking um, civilians or hospitals or, or infrastructure, that, that the whole architecture of upholding uh, international humanitarian law might be compromised by the readiness of international organizations with very specific mandates to accept a loss of that essential conditionality mm. relating to their assistance. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think that is a, um, your response to that, my question there is a very um, a principled and consistent line, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I just wonder whether part of the problem, the reason we are where we are, and I'm sure you, you'd agree with this, is that, of course, increasingly over that period, if you go back to the 1990s until the day, governments have turned to humanitarian action as a substitute 
for for a political response to the conflict and in a, in an odd almost perverse kind of way the growing uh, concern in a normative sense about responding say to mass atrocities which picked up after the disasters in Bosnia and Rwanda and ultimately I suppose reflected in the responsibility to protect places you know pressure on governments to be seen to be doing something and therefore you now have several large UN operations in sub-saharan Africa where they are constantly talking or the Security Council is saying we need to you know finish this mission we've been there long enough but it every time comes up against the argument that if we were to leave there will be a humanitarian disaster and let's at least do that and in the meantime as you say they inevitably get drawn into the conflict uh, in ways that are very very uh, you know, problematic and unfortunate. Um, and I've been saying this in connection with this emphasis on protection of civilians, which I think is absolutely, you know, commendable and important, but it must be uh, a, a substitute for also dealing with the, the politics at the heart of these particular conflicts. Because ultimately, the protection of civilian challenges in places like the DRC are going to be addressed once you move on the political front. Uh, so that I think is, uh, and I and I totally share your your sense that the way perhaps to move forward is to go back as you have done and to to ask you know why do we have these principles in the first place? What are yes. they meant to do? But then at the same time, I suppose emphasize that they aren't a substitute for for dealing with the with the conflict. And that's in a way why I was suggesting that or why I sort of picked up this on the while you were operating very effectively in Afghanistan, it was also a time where, you know, uh, the violence was allowed to, to go on, not because of the humanitarian community, but, you know, the civil war sort of picked up its momentum and set the stage for subsequent crisis. So I wonder whether we need to keep that political dimension in line. And whenever they've tried, I mean, you remember from Bosnia, so uh, Ogata at one point said, you know, this is it, I'm not doing it anymore because we are sort of just making things worse. But she was told, okay, that's fine. Um, but, you know, the Security Council wants you to get on with, uh, you know, the humanitarian side of it. So, you know, there is this conflicting pressures on the humanitarian actors to, to respond. I don't know what you think um, about the political side, the political dimension of this. No, I, th I, I, I completely agree with your with your analysis of, of, of what has been happening. Um, I mean, I was rather directly involved in the development of what is now called the protection of civilians agenda. Yes, uh, because I was in charge of the policy unit uh, in the UN Office for <clears throat> Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in 1999, when we were tasked to produce the Secretary General's first report on the subject. Mm. And the need for that report came precisely from what you've just been describing. The absence of political action um, that would resolve conflicts that were causing a massive amount of uh, civilian deaths and 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 uh, misery, mm. um, and the very charismatic, the then charismatic emergency relief coordinator Sergio Vieira de Mello um, led the uh, development of this concept of protection of civilians in armed conflict because in a number of peacekeeping operations at the time. And, and, and here, perhaps we may move into this very complex relationship between peacekeeping and humanitarian operation. Yes. yes. Um, but the, the initial trigger for the protection of civilians uh, debate and, 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 and uh, agenda was the, um, the fact that in a number of situations, troops contributed to peacekeeping forces were standing by while atrocities were being committed against civilians in areas to which they had been sent yes. because they said, oh, it's not in our mandate to protect civilians. Yeah. Now, one of the things that has happened since then is that in almost all um, current peacekeeping operations, 
protection of civilians is in the mandate of the peacekeepers. And that's a tremendous advance. But it's, um, it's if you like, it's, a, it's an additional sticking plaster. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't solve the problem yeah. that the, the, the political uh, initiative to resolve the conflicts is simply not there. Mm. Um, maybe it's just worth interposing a, a, a little parenthesis, perhaps. Um, David Harland has written an extremely interesting article, which shows, I think, rather convincingly, that in the period from, uh, well, about 1992 up to 2007, the UN was remarkably successful in bringing conflicts to an end. A number of peace agreements, some of them didn't last, others did. Um, but that in 2007, the Security Council um, permanent members split uh, with Russia objecting to a proposal from the Western nations regarding the UN's role in Kosovo. And since then, uh, the UN has been almost completely unsuccessful mm. in bringing conflicts to an end. Mm. Now, with the Security Council split in this way, what do we expect of the UN's humanitarian arm? Um, and some of us worry that exactly as, as you were pointing out, the, the states are more and more, I mean, they have always done it, mm. but even more so now, yes. uh, turning to the UN and saying, oh, fill the gap, provide relief. Uh, you know, do this, do that. Yeah. And uh, some of us worry uh, that if the UN's humanitarian wings mm. are directed by uh, political actors in the Security Council, then actually they cease to be humanitarian. Mm. Now, <laughs> the, the term humanitarian is so widely misused or, or used in so many different senses that using it on its own is, I think, increasingly difficult. Mm. However, if you refer to situations in which you do or do not respect humanitarian principles, then I think this is much, much easier to define. Mm. Uh, we can say that in country X or country Y, uh, the UN is strictly applying humanitarian principles or, or, or it isn't strictly applying humanitarian principles. Yes. And, and we feel that this is a debate in, in which we need to engage much more openly mm. than has been the case in, in recent years. Mm. Um, and, and we need to be open to a range of different options. Uh, perhaps, Matt, it would be worth just throwing in one little extra piece here, because in case people um, don't quite see where the problem is. Mm. When we were in Afghanistan, I don't think anybody referred to the humanitarian imperative. But now, People say to me, oh, you know, if the UN and the ICRC pulled out of Syria, uh, you know, what, what would happen to people in, in need? What would happen to the people who need aid? And here you come to the basic dichotomy, it seems to me. And it, you can look at it like this in very, very simple terms. Um, I'm a representative of an organization uh, with the capacity to meet some humanitarian needs. I'm in a country uh, that is in conflict. I come across a group of people, a community, 
uh, that is in desperate need of assistance. And they say, help, 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 help. Now, I've got the, I've got the, the items. There are the people who need aid. But I also know that a few miles away, in an area controlled by another group, are people who are in absolutely desperate conditions and are being denied access to assistance. What do I do? Do I help these people who are in front of me? Or do I say, oh, sorry, I can't help you because there are people <coughs> over the hill who are in much worse circumstances than you are and who are being denied assistance. And that's the essential dichotomy, yeah. in my view, yeah. that is confronting uh, the UN and the ICRC today. Yeah. Because um, it's, and, and, and very eminent um, authorities on humanitarian action come down on the side of, well, of course, we're going to assist the people in front of us, because that's the humanitarian imperative. We must help where we can. And my response to that is that if you were there in your personal, individual capaci capacity, with your vehicle, which you brought with your own resources, and it's a personal charitable action, then absolutely you should immediately relieve the need that is in front of you. But if you are representing an organization with an institutional mandate and a legitimacy that derives from its adherence to certain fundamental principles, then you can't behave as though you were an individual actor operating in your own personal capacity with your own resources. Mm. Do you see what I mean? Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And so the, 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 the difficulty is how do the organizations that are regularly confronted with this dichotomy uh, resolve it? Mm. What are legitimate ways of, of doing so? And I, I think, you know, we have to bear one very serious thing in mind. Um, there's been a lot of attention, rightly, in recent months even, on the threats to the safety and security of humanitarian workers, humanitarian personnel. And I think one must ask the question of whether um, in situations where humanitarian aid is being distributed in ways that are not in conformity with humanitarian principles, um, we may not inadvertently put humanitarian aid personnel at additional risk mm, yes. because they are not seen as being impartial or neutral. So th th these are phenomenally mm. difficult uh, challenges. And um, our sense is that in the rush to raise more resources for ever growing needs. Some of these really essential dilemmas yeah. have been sort of, <laughs> please, please go away. Please don't bother me with that, you know? Yes. And, and we think this is a mistake. Uh, we think it's, it's really important to, uh, to look in uh, for forensic detail at um, at how organizations are, are thinking through these dilemmas.
Mm. Now, I think that's a incredibly uh, interesting and, 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 and thought provoking. And uh, I keep thinking of some of those challenges in terms of, of what is facing UN peace operations on the ground. And I mean, you presented that particular dilemma now um, about, you know, people suffering on the other side of the hill being in a worse conditions and how do you respond? I mean, I just I just was thinking of, uh, do you remember the crisis around the, uh, the protection of civilian sites in South Sudan, whether or not um, you open them up and provide protection uh, because this was a an immediate uh, threat. Um, yet knowing that if nothing is done by way of following up, you know, politically and addressing all these other issues that need to be addressed, security sector reform, reconciliation, political progress, um, you are you are playing into the, if you like, the dynamics of the conflict as well. Again, a very, very difficult issue, but that might be slightly different perhaps with a peace uh, operation than, than a sort of what you might call a, a purely works of the humanitarian agency. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I wonder whether... Uh, the other thing I, I made me think here, Martin, about what you, what you said, as you, you, are, you are suggesting, and I think rightly, that one has to be prepared to look uh, at, at the range of options in responding to this and be honest about the challenges one is facing. It reminds me of the, you remember the Lakta Brahimi's report back in 2000, who famously, mm -hmm. who famously said that um, the Secretariat has to, to, to learn to say no um, when, you know, the conditions aren't right. Of course, the reality afterwards that, you know, whenever the Secretariat tried to not just say no, but discuss whether this was a good or a bad idea, they were told by the Security Council, well, you know, we hear what you're saying, but just get on with it and deploy a mission, do this, do that. It's just very, very difficult to to, to say no, uh, given the sort of... Uh, uh, so, so I suppose leadership in this, in the debate that you are envisaging, the, the Secretary General himself has to sort of be be at the forefront, I suppose, of, of reasserting the sanctity of those humanitarian principles and, and raise these questions in the debate that you are you are so keen to, to put on the table again. But this is an interesting question because one of the issues is to what extent is the Secretary General in sole command, if you like, yes. of the UN's humanitarian operations. Mm. Remember that General Assembly Resolution 46182 of 1991 established the role of emergency relief coordinator. Now, mm. interestingly, and one can perhaps make too much of this. Although the post has always been combined with the post of Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, yes. the post of Emergency Relief Coordinator, what's missing? Mm -hmm. There's no UN in front of it. It's the emergency relief coordinator. And the fact is that the interagency standing committee, which the emergency relief coordinator chairs, includes a number of agencies which are not part of the UN system. Yes. And they are members. Uh, uh, the the ICRC is an observer, so it's not a full, a full member, but it takes part in the meetings. Yes. But there are NGOs uh, and other organizations which are not part of the UN system, which accept the role of the emergency relief coordinator as the overall coordinator of international humanitarian assistance. Yes. And I think some people would argue, and, and uh, I, I would be among them, that the, this architecture um, means that the emergency relief coordinator needs to um, apply the 
norms and standards relating to humanitarian operations. And these are derived on the one hand from international humanitarian law. And by the way, that only applies to situations of ongoing armed conflict. I mean, the, the emergency relief coordinator is responsible for relief operations in many other situations, yes. which are not uh, involving ongoing armed conflict. Yes, of course. In relation to situations of ongoing armed conflict, um, you know, the, the, the emergency relief coordinator needs to ensure that the operations that he or she is responsible for are conducted in conformity with the norms and standards of international humanitarian law and uh, in accordance with humanitarian principles. And I would argue that the emergency relief coordinator is not obliged to accept instructions from the Security Council mm. or indeed possibly from the Secretary General. Yes. Um, now, th that's, uh, I, I think, <laughs> I think you would find that most holders of the post of, of emergency relief coordinator would say, come on, Martin, that's taking it a bit far. Mm. Uh, and that, you know, if you're appointed to a position of Under Secretary General for humanitarian affairs, well, you know, you report to the Secretary General. Yeah. Um, so whether what we are asking the Secretary General to do is to recognize that he has a role in relation to humanitarian operations, which is completely distinct from his role in relation to peace operations yeah. and the activities of the Security Council, or whether what we're asking him to do is to say to the emergency relief coordinator, I understand that you have a role that is essentially derives from um, the norms and standards of international law and similar principles, and you have to manage that um, independently from me, independently from my role as administrator of the United Nations system. Mm. You know, you, you can argue it, you can argue it both ways. But I personally think that um, the, the role of the UN in um, humanitarian relief operations in situations of ongoing armed conflict must be disentangled from dis any decisions made by the Security Council. Right. Yeah. Fascinating and, and very, very interesting. I think we've covered a, a, a terrific amount of, of ground, but in a very, very sort of substantive way. I, I really thought that was um, very, very interesting. And I was going to say, I should have said initially that with regard to your own sort of history and experience and involvement, of course, there is your, your excellent and very readable and interesting book which came out in 2015, which is on our reading list, uh, you'd be happy to know, Blinded by Humanity Inside the UN's Humanitarian Operations. Um, and I hope that um, as soon as we manage to emerge from the pandemic, um, we'll be able to bring you on campus and, and continue the discussion there, because I'm sure that there would have been a lot of questions arising out of what you have just said. And indeed, you might well get some emails after uh, I have posted this on our uh, on our uh, course web website. Um, so I think Martin will bring the uh, the discussion of the conversation to an end. And I'd just like to thank you again for taking the time to do this. I thought it was absolutely terrific. Well, Matt, thank you so much. It's it's a it's a great pleasure, and and I will be uh, delighted to try and respond to uh, to questions from your from your students and. Uh, I certainly, I really look forward to, to coming to King's again and, uh, and meeting you and your colleagues and some of your students.
Thank you so much.